Welcome to Somerville Livewire. I'm Mary Lemire. Imagine you're walking down the street on a beautiful evening in an urban neighborhood, maybe here in Somerville somewhere, and you see a teenager walking toward you. What goes through your mind? A teenage boy, shall we say. You know, what about if you're on the bus and there's kind of a group of teenagers in the back horsing around? What do you think? Do you see them as perhaps somebody that you're afraid of just because they're, you know, they're teenagers, they're pretty big, they're pretty tall, maybe you're smaller? Um, or do you see them as people who are tapped into their neighborhoods, they know what's going on, and that they're actually a resource, that they've got the know it, you know, they've got the savvy to help solve some of our problems in our community. So to address these things, there's an organization, excuse me, called the Center for Teen Empowerment. And we're very pleased to be joined by Danny McLaughlin, who's a program director at this organization. Danny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thanks for having me. So tell us, just to start off, what does the Center for Teen Empowerment do? All right, great. Well, so we, we do a lot of things, so I'll try and be as brief as possible because I know we have probably a number of questions to get at today. So um, what the Center of Teen Empowerment does is we actually hire young people to be organizers around issues that you face in the community. Uh, we have an intensive hiring process where we'll interview roughly um, 70 to 80 young people for about 30 to 40, sometimes 50 positions. Um, each one of those in each of our five programs that we have those youth are tasked with looking at the issues and finding a sophisticated way that they can address the issues that can draw in their peers, the community, and find ways that we can um, help work towards the issues. It's not always about solving issues. There's certain things like substance abuse that exists throughout all communities, uh, but try and find ways that we can contribute voice um, and try and find some solutions that might be able to help, whether it's in policy or with just connection. So tell us about those five areas. Well, right now, uh, we're running uh, different programs. We're, we're in our summer session right now, so there's a few different programs. We have one program called the Youth Organizer Program. Um, that's working with about 10 to 12 young people, and they're looking at different issues that you face in the community. Um, right now, a good example is they, they did an open mic down the Mystics recently, adding to youth voice, so people have an opportunity to kind of speak on different issues, use their talents, use their kind of thoughts and ideas talk about different issues that they feel like are presenting young people in the community and also offer solutions. So that's the Youth Organizer Program. Uh, I'm going to an event a little bit uh, with our Mental Wellness Program coordinators and they're uh, in, in the Youth uh, Organizers over there. They're holding an event around access to mental wellness resources and destigmatizing mental health. Uh, we have a media program that on Monday, August 30th, I don't know when this will be aired, so it might be a little after that, uh, we'll be holding our first ever uh, short film, which is about a day in the life of uh, being a Somerville teen. Then we also have an outdoors program. They're currently actually on a camping trip. So they took a group of Somerville kids out there. They're out in New Hampshire doing a little bit of hiking, a little bit of camping, and exposing them um, to nature and things that are accessible to them. Um, and then we also have had a library group that meets in the school year, uh, an art space program that actually worked with the uh, Mudflat Studio on creating a mural on a bench that's gonna be going out that kind of reflects um, how you feel about the community and kind of what they think represents the community. And um, yeah, th those are kind of, we, we have a number of groups, it depends on the time of year uh, when we're running those groups. And I think I'm leaving one out though, because I, I didn't write them all down. Sometimes thinking on the well, spot. You'll think of it as soon as yeah. we're finished here. You know, that's, that's what always happens. So, I mean, all of this sounds fantastic. I mean, it sounds like stuff that, you know, adults might be interested too. That's, yeah. it's just wonderful. So how many kids are involved with, you know, for when you have an event, for example, um, the August 30th event, how many kids would, would be there? So right now, so we're dealing with COVID right now and with, with things picking up, we, we actually have to put a cap on this event coming up on August 30th for about 40 people. Um, just because we want to make sure that we're not exposing too many people. We, we'll actually all have to wear masks at this event. Uh, we we're planning, Fortunately, we had that planned before even the city just reimposed the uh, mask guidelines just because we want to play it safe this summer. Uh, but it, it ranges. We, we have an annual peace conference every year um, when we met in person, obviously, that, that that would gain anywhere between three and 500 people, all different people from the community, whether it's young people, elected officials, parents, teachers, um, family members, whoever it may be. The open mic last week, we had about 35 people show up um, outside of our teen empowerment staff to kind of just take part of it, listen, participate in it. So it all ranges. We have 
Uh, like I said earlier, there's anywhere between 30 and 50 young people working to us with us at a time. Um, in organizing those events, they can range. If it's a meeting with an elected official, that might be a, a smaller meeting so that way all voices can get heard, or it could be a larger scale event where it might be, hey, in the past, we've run different things like block parties where it's like, you're getting actually 100 people out. Currently in COVID, everything looks a lot different. Right. And you know, a lot of our work is about gathering groups and getting people together. Uh, but we have to do a lot of, uh, think about safety yep. first. Yeah, and are these all pretty much, are these Somerville um, teenagers, Somerville students? They're, they're all Somerville teenagers. They're 14 to 21. Uh, and yeah, we, we pay them to organize events, to organize events that mm-hmm. will interest their peers and try and draw them in so that they, it's not just, you know, we don't want just our youth who are hired to benefit from the program. We want it to extend into their peer group. So they're really, the bottom line to it, they're community organizers. And they're looking at the issues and trying to find ways that they can really get at the issues. Like I said earlier, you're not always going to solve everything. You're not going to solve gentrification in a group that meets nine months in the school year. But you can start to get at policies that can impact gentrification. That's just an example. And how much do they, how much do you pay them? Uh, Right now, it's $13.50 an hour. I think in October, we're going up to $14.50 an hour. Uh, the state minimum wage is set to go up to 14 50 in January. So we're going to stop that a little bit earlier. So we want just so that way we don't have to have issues adjusting our payroll mid year. Right. Now, but, yeah. tell me a little bit about the demographics of the kids, because let's face it, there are some kids who come such from, you know, very challenging environments where maybe they have to look after younger siblings, mm-hmm. um, you know, or they, you know, they, they, you know, perhaps, I mean, this is decent pay, um, but maybe they have to have a job that they work at, you know, year round. So, you know, do you have a range of people or who are the people who are able to, you know, participate in this? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I always like to tell people we work with some of the kids um, and that's all different because we want we want the groups to be a reflection of the youth community. So that means yeah. we don't want to work with just one specific type of kid or one specific group. We want to make sure, hey, we have a kid that might be have some uh, risk involvement, maybe come from a tougher home, also working with a youth who might be uh, in the National Honor Society. We might have student athletes working with kids who work a second job who are trying to contribute to their family. We really want to make sure we're representing all the different demographics. Some of those um, real our diversity is within our youth. And we want to make sure that we're representing that. And that, that comes from different income brackets, different gender identities, different uh, racial makeups, whatever it may be, different uh, ages. So we really want to make sure we're covering a, a true representation. And that can be tricky. You know, that, that really goes into our outreach and making sure that our staff are well equipped to hit all the different targeted areas, whether it's at the high school or some of the um, surrounding schools like Prospect Hill Academy, and also areas where young people hang out, um, some public library, the uh, mystics on the basketball court, wherever it may be. So that way we're getting a true representation of some of the teens, because we want to make sure that all those issues are represented. And, and some of those are very divided community right now where you have a kind of a have and have not. Um, yeah. But it's important for both sides to understand that that exists too. So we might have some young people that come from a two parent household of a higher income in other kids that might be coming from, hey, maybe it's a single parent household, maybe it's a um, tougher income situation, Um, but making sure that they both understand that they're there and also can build friendships uh, within that so you can see yourself uh, in different, you know, aspects of the community. Right. So I'm glad you brought up the have or have not, because that's honestly what was kind of going through my mind. And the question is, if you're programming these activities, um, you know, there are some neighbors that are harder to get into again, because the parents are working, they don't have the time, there might be more um, siblings, um, and, and so forth. So how would you say for the, for the kids that you're hiring, what's kind of the breakdown between the haves and the have nots? Is it 50 50? Is it, you know, how does it? What does it look well, like? I think the demographics, uh, if you look at the just the data of young people in Somerville, uh, Somerville High School, when you break down really looking at free and reduced lunch, that, that tells a lot of a story. And I think it's about 80% of our young people that are living in a from the community are on free or reduced lunch. So when you really think about that being part of, you know, the demographics of the community, you, you want to focus on that. You want to make sure you're yeah. getting that, but you also want to make sure you're getting that other 20% so we can kind of connect to everybody. But, you know, one of the beautiful things about our program is when you think about kids who are coming from situations, maybe you do have to work two jobs. Maybe you do have mm-hmm. to have some scheduling conflicts. The fact that we have five different programs allows us to be a little flexible with them. Where it's like, hey, you can't do this program because it meets these times of these three days. But hey, this program meets once a week and it meets on this day. So it gives us a greater opportunity over the years to be able to plug different people into different programs. So that way they can actually get connected a little further. Years ago, we only had one program that was about 10 to 12 youth 
that kind of met four days a week. And this, the city has actually uh, granted us funding over the um, probably about eight years ago where we we're able to expand our program and be able to connect and work with more young people than ever. So how many adults are involved with this? Well, that, that all depends. Uh, adult staff wise, we, we have a team of uh, the seven of us who work and there's a mix between full-time and part-time people. Uh, we have some former youth who work for us who are working as kind of junior staff, senior youth, um, that are kind of a nice bridge in between things. And then our job is to engage the community. So our, our mission is to work uh, with youth and adults to become agents of social change. So we want to, our focus is with the young people, but when we hold events, we try and draw adults in too, because the best solutions come by um, everyone kind of coming together and the, the collective thought, uh, rather than just be like, hey, this one group thinks this. It's like, well, how, how can we all come together and come with a consensus-based approach? Right, and do you have adult volunteers? Sometimes, um, if, if we have things specifically to plug them into, um, sometimes it can be tricky with adult volunteers because you might have to run a quarry check. You know, they need to do all that. What, what role do they play? Um, yeah. Our staff goes through a lot of training. You know, they're, they're, yeah. they're meeting, they're, they're, they're learning how to be, that they're mandate reporters. They're learning how to be organizers. They're learning how to be uh, planners. They're learning to do budgets. They're doing a lot of different things. So sometimes roles, unless we're having a larger scale event, which we might need, hey, volunteers to give out, you know, the, uh, the program or to, you know, do food at the table. It's a little trickier. We have had volunteers in the past, but there's a uh, really big learning curve and a, a really um, productive onboarding process that we have for our staff. So not everyone can just jump on in uh, and, and participate like that. Yeah, yeah. So where do you get your money? Where's, your, where's the money come from to fund this? Yeah, so uh, a few different things. Um, I can talk about historically, uh, state, federal, private, you know, grants, mm-hmm. funding. Right now, the lion's share of our money at the Somerville site, we have sites in Rochester, New York, and in Boston also, uh, comes from the city of Somerville. The, the mayor prioritized youth and actually having youth voice as something that he really cared about. And he, uh, we did an RFP with the city and received funding. So a majority, I'd say about 80% of our funding right now comes through the city of Somerville, which we greatly appreciate because it's empowering more leaders than we even could before. And I assume that's just for the Somerville programs, not for the Rochester, yes, New York just programs for the and, program. and, yep. and so forth. Yeah. And I noticed that Jack Connolly is on the board of directors um, for yep. the entire organization. So we have people in Somerville who are, you know, at involved at that um, in at that level also. Yeah. Jack's been a long time supporter of the organization. Him, him and our former executive director, uh, they go way back to uh, yeah. the 70s in Somerville. Not oh, aging them at all. They, they both look great, but. You know, they've been here a long time doing a lot of good work. Yeah. So if you had another $50,000 to spend, how would you spend it? Uh, Well, I don't need to think about that one because I know I'd add to our program. I'd I'd add more staff, um, specific things around maybe I'd love to have a group that specifically worked in uh, the housing developments where it can really work on targeting some of the uh, stuff that's going on there, again, advocating for more voice uh, in those specific areas potentially um, having a youth council, which is a, either a representative in the, in the schools. We do have an education program, that was a program I missed earlier, and they're working on educational policies, but something within the high school or within a deeper connection to City Hall, which we do have a great connection, but something where it's like, hey, these youth are tasked with looking at policies around stuff that the city can really get at, meeting with um, different elected officials regularly. We're able to do that throughout the year, but making that be like that group, that's their group's priority. Uh, and same thing with working in housing in particular. I think it'd be great to add some money to programs down there and really start to look at the 18 to 24 year old crowd. So I think a lot of the issues that we're seeing right now aren't as much in our younger teens. Obviously there are tons of things going on, but we're seeing a lot of issues happening with the kind of crowd that's graduated high school and kind of trying to find ways that they can get connected to jobs and other opportunities and you know, fill that void. Okay, that's great. So we only have, we have less than a minute left. If there's one thing you want to leave um, with the adults in Somerville um, about what teens need, what would that be? Uh, they need people to listen to actually, I, I, th- I, I get a kick out when some people think about like youth voting early at like 16, eight years old. Um, you know, a lot of the youth who would do that are actually more civically engaged than most adults uh, and they listen. So I, I think it's the idea of listening to youth and get, get gathering their input, um, you know, and asking them the questions that can lead towards them giving you the answers. They actually have a lot of solutions when it comes time to issues you face and issues the city face. 
Uh, and again, you can get the best ideas can come from the collection of asking a lot of people, you know, get that, that collection of data from a lot of, you know, young people and adults. So I think listening goes a long way and not being afraid because young people are actually, um, you know, way more, people say young people today are, are lazy and that's far from the truth. They're way more productive. They can get information a lot quicker and they are, uh, you know, really active members of our community. That's so great. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we're out of time. I just want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy day, um, sharing your thoughts and expertise about this really great, interesting program. Well, thanks for having me. And let me know if you'd ever like me or any of our staff to come back. Now to get the teen point of view, we're joined by Leonore Galinda, who was a teen involved with teen empowerment and is now on the staff. And um, thank you very much for joining us. You have a nickname that you go by. Could you tell <laughs> yes. us what your nickname is? <laughs> yes, uh, so Angie. Um, your nickname is Angie. Okay, yes, great. My middle name. Okay, so um, tell us about how you first heard about teen empowerment. Um, was it when you were at school at Somerville High School or somewhere else? Uh, yeah, I actually, um, they were handing out these little yellow um, flyers. And I remember getting one from one of my friends. I, 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 I mean, it was so long ago, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it ended up in my hands somehow. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. And I was looking for a way to earn money at the time. I was like 14 and I was like, this is incredible. Like they're going to pay me to do this stuff. So I, I applied, I was really nervous, so super scared. Um, and thankfully I, I got a position as a youth organizer. That's great. So you were 14. So was that mm -hmm. ninth grade that you were? Yeah, actually. Yeah. It was, it was the fall of my first, uh, my freshman year at Somerville High. Yeah. Okay. So you hadn't, so you didn't have any perception of what it was or anything. You just found out from that. And yes. did any of your other friends, um, also apply? Uh, they did actually. Um, I, I, I remember talking about it with a few of them and I know that they had applied, but I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't be sure as to whether or not they, because they interviewed everyone in groups. So it's not like you were in the same group of people that were being interviewed. So, um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure out of my specific group of friends, I was the only one to apply. Okay, great. So, and how much um, were you paid an hour? Um, back then I, I think it was like twelve dollars or something like that. Um, it was yeah, in, it was in, it was in between something like that. Okay, so that was pretty good money for a teenager at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it was. I was super proud. Okay, that's great. And would you have been working anyway? Would you say? I was leaning more towards doing like childcare type of work. So I was like posting flyers about uh, babysitting and I had helped babysit um, a, a neighbor's um, a neighbor's child that lived uh, where I used to live in Somerville. So um, yeah, I, I probably would have just been babysitting, honestly. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I did babysitting when I was your age and that didn't pay nearly as well <laughs> as, as other things, I can assure you. And you work harder. <laughs> so, okay. So you get the job and you start doing it. So what was it like reaching out to other teens um, for the programs? What kind of programs did you run? And, you know, how did you feel about um, getting other teens involved with it? Um, so I, I, I applied for TE and then, um, I want to say around my junior year of high school, I applied to um, the Books of Hope program. Um, and I did that, I think, until the beginning of my senior year. And then I, um, I ended up not completing the program. Um, <clears throat> but okay. I, yeah. Sorry. I just wanted, no, that's okay. I would just, you know, when you were 14, what were the kinds of activities that a 14 year old um, would be involved with? Tell us a little bit about your experiences at that time. So I, um, I was, you know, 14. I didn't really have any kind of goals. I was looking to make friends and, you know, hang out after school, kill time before you had to go home and, you know, ha the humdrum of the evening life as a teenager, you have to do your homework, then you have dinner, your parents drill you about your day. <laughs> so um, it was a lot of that. And 
I, I really had like, I, I knew I wanted to do when I did start working, I wanted to do something important. And when I came across TE, I was just like shocked that like, wow, this is exactly the type of thing I've been looking for. Um, and in addition to TE, I also was a member of the Somerville Youth Council. Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay, great. So what did TE do? Like um, Danny was telling us there are music programs, there's a camping thing, there's, you know, what, what sorts of things um, did they have at that time? So at that time, it was strictly just the youth organizers. Um, we were basically a group of about 10 to 12 um, teens between, I think it was 14 to 20 or 21. And um, we we basically talked about things that were going on within our communities or our neighborhoods that were directly affecting us you know things that adults may think like oh they're not they're more, more worried about their acne than they are you know what's happening in the world you know around them but it was far from the truth i mean we had kids from different backgrounds so we had kids who you know, came from a two-parent household. We can't. We had kids who came from a one-parent household. We can't. We had kids who were middle, you know, middle-class working families. We had kids that were um, living in uh, in housing, um, and you know, they had you know single parents who were working late hours. Um, a few of them were, um, you know, gang affiliated, um, if not directly involved themselves. And so, it was a chance for. A person like me who came from humble kind of beginnings to just be like you know exposed to this and acknowledge like oh my god there are kids my age who are dealing with more than just acne um and it was really a it was it was a really awakening kind of moment so an opportunity to share experiences with each other and um, learn about, you know, just as we want to learn more about the entire community of Somerville, you were learning about the community of um, teenagers and sharing yeah. those, those things. Mm -hmm. So um, how has that changed over time? So, you know, and kind of what do you think is the impact TE has on the teen community and on the, you know, community of Somerville overall, would you, if, if you know, if at all. Yeah, um, I think it, so when I started with TE, there was a time where there was a lot of um, youth violence happening. I mean, there were stabbing, shootings. And so we were really championing, championing these stories of these kids who were witnessing it or who had friends that had those, these things happen to them and be like, you know, this isn't just affecting the adults in the community, it's affecting us. And this is how we're taking the power back by talking about our experiences, sharing them with our community and letting them know that we want things to change and we're going to do anything and everything that is within our power to do so. Um, so it was a, um, it was a time where I just, I really got to learn a lot and um, it just kind of brought in my sense of the world around me. Yeah, yeah. And those sto are stories that so many of them, you read about them in the paper, but when mm -hmm. you actually meet someone who's experiencing that, you know, it just takes it to a whole um, different level. So if, if you were gonna say, if the, if the community of Somerville, you know, says, what do we need to do with teens? Like, what are the most important things that you think teens would value from Somerville? Do you have any idea, like what, what sorts of things would you um, recommend that, you know, that we know about and or do? Yeah, um, I think listening to what they have to say with regard to things like um, school policy, um, you know, real world events, they're not, you know, some of the stuff that we talked about uh, this summer with our um with our youth organizers was um, things that I had personally experienced as a teenager myself, so I could relate. Mm -hmm. But on top of it, a whole new set of mental health uh, issues came into play because of um, the pandemic last year and having, you know, they were told they were going to go back in two weeks and, and I never went back. So it was, you know, I, I think Danny said they kind of had like the floor ripped out from under them in a mm -hmm. sense. And, um, it was it, it was a really trying time. Some of them came from, um, you know, normal family home, you know, normal safe uh, family homes. Others had um, uh, 
uh, personal issues at home that just kind of you know really tax them mentally on top of having to learn at home 24 7 not be able to go out and hang out it was it was a lot so just to hear them speak about it and relate to each other and like yeah like i feel the same way and hearing how happy they were that we were doing you know um two days in person one day remote so that they could have that um you know that that feeling again of being around pe kids their own age and just you know talking about um various issues and and you know sharing experiences so it was it was amazing so so many things to to think about and do you have a mechanism so it sounds like you get together and have events or meetings i mean do you literally like sit around in a circle and share things or is it more informal than that so we try we try and base our events and our initiatives around things that are actually happening in our community um, currently, TE Now has expanded over the um, uh, over the years, and so we've added more programs to our center. So now we have a media program, we have an outdoors program, an education program, a mental wellness program, and we also still have the YOs um, group. And so they all tackle different aspects of community life. Um, you know, the education group focuses on um, policies that um, in, in the Somerville public school systems and how they directly affect um, the youth that are involved and, you know, campaigning for, you know, maybe dressing policy reforms or things like that. So, um, and that's just education. Um, yeah. uh, and YOs, we typically like to base our issues around stuff that's happening in our community. So one big thing that we're we are going to be working on over the next couple of um, weeks is going to be hiring for the fall. And in doing so, we want to address what's been happening at the Mystic um, with um, the, the recent shootings that have happened there. And, you know, we know that there are youth in the, in, 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 uh, the Mystics that, that may be involved with that. And we want to just kind of be like, hey, you guys don't have to do that. It may look cool. It may be something that you, you just... It's, a, it's become kind of like a way of life and you're just kind of stepping into that, that mindset. But um, we want to give them the opportunity to say, hey, you don't have to do that. Come here and, and do something to, to fix that, to change that, to stop that because you have that power. That's such a big issue because I actually went back and looked at, you know, the shootings and I even mapped them out to see where they're located. And, you know, there is kind of a cluster as far as where they're located. So are these, and, and we only have about a minute left. So there were so many other things that I would love to talk with you yes. about, but just very briefly, has your perception of what teens need changed since you came on staff? I mean, you know, what, what do you see now that maybe you didn't see when you were a teen? Definitely a lot more of the uh, mental health issues being brought up um, and specifically um, one that has kind of stayed consistent, I feel, is bullying. Um, that was one of the issues that we had discussed in our brainstorm with our youth this year, and that was something they felt strongly about, along with um, kind of uh, drug and substance abuse, alcohol abuse, things like that. Um, so it was it was interesting to see them kind of touch on those subjects and, and know that they're fully aware of what's happening, why it's happening, and, and what they may be able to do to prevent that or stop it. Yeah, teens teens know a lot more than than what we we adults forget about all the things that we knew when we were teens. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, well, I'm so sorry, but we're out of time. I want to thank you so much for joining us and sharing your perspectives and your knowledge you. um, on this really important topic. And for those watching, thank you very much for watching again. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Somerville Livewire.